movement. Um, we're bridging the gap between 1968 and 2018, which is 50 years of just revolution and 50 years of activism. Um, so we also incorporated a new part that incorporates um, hip hop, a little hip hop aspect to it. So they bring the old with the new. So when we get to that, we'll teach you how the words flow and go. So your words are first, everybody's got a right to live. And before this campaign fails, we'll all go down to jail. Because everybody has a right to live. You got that? You got that. All right. Um, and so then the second part uh, will be everybody's got a right to live. And then you all will say to live. And then everybody's got a right to love. To love. To love. Everybody's got a right to dream. To, to dream. dream. Everybody's got a right to learn. To, to learn. learn. Got it? All right. Yeah. All right. Here we go. Everybody's got a right to live. Welcome. everyone. Good evening. My name is Reverend Angela Martin, and I am one of the tri-chairs of the Maryland Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, and we are delighted and thrilled that you joined us this evening. You could have been anywhere, and likely you had nowhere else to go. That's a good thing, but we're excited that you're here with us for such a uh, an important time as this. This is an important time and you are welcomed to the very first virtual town hall for Maryland. All right, that's wonderful. Um, I, as I mentioned, I'm the tri-chair for the state of Maryland, one of the tri-chairs for the state of Maryland for the Poor People's Campaign. The Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival, is just that. It's a call for moral revival in our country on behalf of poverty, of the poor, of low wealth, those persons who are affected by what we call the five pillars. And those are systemic racism, poverty, ecological devastation the war economy and militarism, and the distorted moral narrative that goes, that goes about in this country with regard to how the poor are, what it means to be a patriot, nationalism in general. So we are seeking to change the paradigm, flip the script, if you will, on how people actually view poverty in this country. Poverty is a sin and it should be, it should not be that the richest country on the face of the earth should have the amount of poverty that we do. That the persons in this country should struggle as much as they do. And um, we're seeking to change that. And we're glad that you're gonna be a part of that. Here in Maryland, we are uh, excited that we are trying to bring about the entire state of Maryland at this point in time. As you can see from the map, we will be stretching from the farthest corners of, the, of Garrett County all the way down to the, the lower shore of Wycombe or of Worcester County. In our groupings, we try to kind of group ourselves so that each area has a, a kind of demographic feel to each other and so that 
persons don't have to travel too far to get to a poor people's campaign meeting. So those, those places out in Garrett County, Allegheny County, Washington, Frederick and Carroll, we call that our Western area. Baltimore City, Baltimore and Harford is our uh, Baltimore crew. Our Northern Shore is Cecil County, Kent County, Queen Anne's and Caroline. Whereas our Lower Shore is Talbot, Dorchester, Wicomico, Somerset, and Worcester. The lower southern Maryland is Charles County and Calvert County, as well as St. Mary's. And the central region is Howard and Anne Arundel, with Montgomery and Prince George's being two separate regions in and of themselves. So altogether, we have eight regions throughout the state, lots of opportunities for you to be able to participate right where you are. We're excited about having you join. We're excited about other places in the, in the state of Maryland that have yet to get their teams up. So we are excited that you have joined us this evening. And also joining us this evening, we are, I'm delighted to have with us one of our organizers from Montgomery County, David Mott. David? Oh, David is muted. <laughs> uh oh, there he is. There we go. Okay. There you go. There you right, go. That's good. Yeah, it's better to be unmuted than muted, I say. Um, so let me introduce myself. As, as Angela said, I am a member of the team for Montgomery County. Uh, I've been involved with the uh, Poor People's Campaign for almost two years now and, um, and uh, have found it to be uh, ex just exhilarating. Uh, so uh, having introduced myself, I want to make a couple points and, and I'd like to say, let, you know, let us connect the dots. You know, Angela talked about the, the five pillars um, that represent the threads of various different struggles going on uh, throughout the country that the Poor People's Campaign as a fusion campaign are pulling together to create a powerful movement uh, to sweep away uh, the injustices in this country and to really uh, have it live up to its promise. Uh, the COVID, and we want to connect the dots in connection with the COVID-19 pandemic. This pandemic has rented the proverbial curtain to reveal the true nature and unjust and unequal society here where wealth is created by us all, but it is distributed unequally and unjustly where it is not needed most, but primarily for wealthy and powerful minority, letting the devil take the hindmost. We are now in a new era, the COVID era, and important lessons are to be learned and applied to our work. This pandemic has changed our world. It has changed our lives. It has taken many lives from our communities and our families. We are no doubt washing our hands, but we have yet to wash away injustice. We will hear tonight from several brothers and sisters who are on the front lines of the fight for justice and on the front lines of the pandemic. They have been impacted by this pandemic and are work with people who have and are witness to the injury caused by our current system of inequality. They are not telling you their stories tonight to gain your pity. They are in fact the Paul Revere's of our time, opening our eyes to how society treats workers, people of color, women, indigenous peoples, gay folks, marginalized people, the poor. The pandemic has pulled back the curtain and exposed the inadequacies and injustices inherent in our society and our economy. It has exposed the truth that the economy is working perfectly well for those who own it, not so well for the rest of us. There are, on a normal day, you would say in the COVID era, a good day. 140 million people are poor in this country. 50 million people make less than $15 an hour. The federal minimum wage is still only $7.25. It would take, it would take a minimum wage worker at KFC, 933 years to make what the company's CEO makes in one year. That's not right. Richest 10% take in 50% of all income. Wealth is even more skewed. 
30 million people, 30 million Americans have no health insurance on a good day, right? The rights and power of working people and the poor have been under relentless attack by Democrats and Republicans for decades. And Republicans try at every turn to undermine voting rights, our democracy, and reduce the collective power of workers. Racism is rampant and it's used to divide working people, to weaken their power, on and on. That's on a normal day. Mm -hmm. We have to be clear. We cannot go back to normal. That is not good. Under the pandemic, now, 30 million people have lost their jobs in a matter of months. They lost their job, they were unemployed, they lost their income, health insurance. The fragility and inequality of our healthcare system is now exposed to the detriment of those who need it most. The, vi the virus has exposed the, exposed the lack of a humane social infrastructure to support working people. There is no paid sick leave. There's no child care, paid child care. There's no paid family leave. Paltry unemployment benefits from underinvested systems can't be delivered for months past the date of need. Congress recently passed, as you probably know, um, the, uh, the Paycheck Protection Act. You know, results are spotty and the money is running out. Trump and his allies now openly push to force workers back to work regardless of safety concerns. They refuse to consider additional help, despite concern raised by the former, this guy is a Republican, FDA Administrator Scott Gottlieb, that recovery is going to probably mean an 80% economy for some time to come. It is this callous disregard for the lives of working people of all situations that the Poor People's Campaign moral narrative seeks to challenge and to change. In our society, wealth, the wealth that we all create is not equally distributed. Neither is pollution and neither are the effects of COVID-19. Poor people, people of color are disproportionately impacted, receiving less care historically and in the moment as a result suffering from the quote unquote underlying conditions of poverty, neglect, and death at its disproportionate rate. The virus has reduced our gross domestic product by 5% in just two months. Climate change threatens to reduce it by 15% or more. We may find a vaccine for COVID, we may gain immunity to it, but we have to be clear just on this one front alone that there will be no vaccine for climate change. It will be a permanent condition for hundreds of years and the damage will be at least three times worse. The stories that you're gonna hear today from the individuals uh, represent, uh, represent our current condition writ large. And they are also a warning about what awaits us and our children if we do not act now. I want to welcome you to the Poor People's Campaign, a campaign for a national call for moral revival. We have a society to heal and we have a world to win. And so I welcome you and let's get about it. That's, absolutely, that's absolutely right, David. You can't be, we, you, you have hit it right on the head. And as a matter of fact, when I have a chance to uh, travel in the state of Maryland and, and just introduce persons to the Poor People's Campaign and tell them about the Poor People's Campaign if they hadn't heard about it already, a lot of persons, um, not a lot, but oftentimes I do hear persons say, well, poor, well, I'm not poor. I mean, I don't consider myself rich, but I'm definitely not poor. And I want to push back and challenge you on that aspect. I want to push back and challenge persons on that type of thinking. If you can go without having a paycheck for a month, two months, six months, you're poor. You're right here. If you can go without health care or can survive a catastrophe in your, um, in your life like a... a terminal illness or a family member dying 
suddenly or um, loss of a limb and loss of one income if you were a two income household. You're part of the poor people's campaign. If you don't have adequate health care, you're part of the poor people's campaign. If you don't have access to just the basic fundamentals of, of um, housing and the basics of being able to buy food and groceries, if you are in areas of this state that have pollution simply because of where you live, you need to be a part of this Poor People's Campaign. You need to be a part of our campaign. And so we're glad to have you here this evening. I wanna remind everyone and just let everyone know that we are indeed broadcasting live right now on Facebook. So tell your friends if they are in other areas to not only join us, but also check out our, our broadcast as you will be able to view this again and share it with your friends and coworkers, family, everyone that you know on Facebook, on our Facebook page. And if you have not gone to our Facebook page, Maryland PPC, there's definitely a place that you need to sign up and join. Okay, for, so for this evening, so for this evening, we've got some interesting and exciting things planned for you this evening. We're gonna first hear from, um, as David mentioned, some speakers that have come to share their testimony there to give us a view a glimpse of what's going on on the ground for them as well as um we'll be able to engage and, and perhaps even ask questions if, they, if we have enough time after that you are actually going to have a chance to speak and get involved in in the participation and process by joining one of our breakout sessions where we'll be able to share throughout the state of maryland and share our own uh, experiences within this pandemic. Then after that, we're going to talk about how you can directly get involved and make a difference in this campaign right from where you are. And then also we're going to show you how to get connected and get ready for our major, major event, which is June 20th, 2020. We're going to show you how you can get registered for june2020.org and be able to join in the largest ever digital march on washington it's going to be exciting so david who uh do are we going into our day our breakout session first here what'd you say He's on mute. All right. Well, we're going I'm to unmute it. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I got to stay unmuted here. This is important. Anyway, yeah, we're going to have breakouts. The good news, I, I was looking down below, and, and, and the good news here, quite frankly, is that there are over 100 people on this call. Uh, and so, really, give yourselves a socially distanced pat on the back. Uh, and it, you really deserve it. It's great that this many people are on this call. The bad news is that, like, in this setting, it makes it difficult just to open up the mics and have a wide ranging discussion, but we think it is important that you talk to each other. So we are going to break down into smaller groups and virtual breakout rooms, and you're going to be assigned a breakout room and you will be put into a breakout room uh, with uh, five other folks to get to know each other, to talk about uh, what's on your mind. And to, the, to facilitate the discussion, we're going to ask each of you to share with your group members the answer to the following question. The question is this, how has the pandemic deepened our understanding of what is broken and needs to be fixed in our society? And, has it, how, and how has it, if it has, motivated you to join the PPC and deepen or deepen your commitment to it? So if you would take time, you know, organize yourself here, there's not gonna be a moderator, you moderate yourself, introduce yourself to each other, and then as you introduce each other, answer that question, if you will, how has the pandemic deepened your understanding? What's broken needs to be fixed. How has it motivated you to join the people's, Poor People's Campaign or deepen your commitment to it? When you leave the break after about 10 minutes, you will be automatically moved out of your room uh, back to the plenary, so to speak. And as you leave or as you end up back at the plenary, if you would, and if you think it's worthwhile, hopefully it is, uh, post a comment in the chat room of something you said 
or something you heard that you think it is important for other people to hear and witness, okay? And Angela, will be looking for those, and we can't read them all, but we'd like to read a few of them at least so that other people will know some of the thoughts and discussions that took place, okay? So if you're ready, we're gonna move you into your rooms now, and we'll see you back here in 10 minutes or so. Oh, there we go. Welcome back, everyone. So I'm going to, um, I see some, a lot of awesome conversations have been having. I'm reading some of the conversation that uh, some of the posts have placed. For those of you who um, joined us late and are, were not able to participate in, in some of the discussions, one of the questions that was being asked was how has the pandemic deepened our understanding of what is broken and what needs to be fixed in our society. So that was a question that persons have been um, reflecting on and sharing. And the other question was, how has it motivated you to join the PPC or deepen your commitment to the Poor People's Campaign? So I am excited to read some of those some of the reflections that you have, some of the information that you shared and comments that were just really salient. If you could put that in your chat box down below and we'll begin to share some of those thoughts and, and some of those reflections, I would love to. One of the um, conversations, let's see, David Grant says, not long ago, the difference in pay between the top person and the bottom person was 20 times. Now it's over 200 times. This is not acceptable. That's absolutely right. That is absolutely right. And particularly in these days where a lot of corporate um, persons are uh, up at the top echelons are taking massive amounts of, of bonuses and, and things of that nature, where as the rest of the persons on everyday, everyday Joes are being laid off and, and not receiving pensions because of it. Yeah. Shonda Coster said it exposed our weak education system. Absolutely. Absolutely. Kathy, Kathy said there needs to be systems in place so that people don't lose basic means to live when something like this happens. Absolutely. People need housing, Patrice Davis says. People need housing, health care, food, and basic needs, but it won't happen if people in privilege don't share their power. Keep hope, and one day we will meet together in a big rally in person. Indeed. Indeed. In breakout room number 11, Don is reporting that sharing, not taking more than you need, housing, health care, food, access to opportunity, the disabled now seem to be disposable. And this puts a mirror up to persons, uh, up to people's faces. Privileged people just don't realize how many, how, how, they, how much they're privileged. That's indeed right. Steve Brigham said, once in a lifetime opportunity to turn our system right side up. Absolutely. Make it work for everybody. And that's the goal. That is our goal in the PPC. Let's make this system work for everybody. Um, Kenzie Young said, a gentleman from our group noted that we see what is happening in this country happen before Trump, happened before Trump and will happen after Trump. In other words, we need to take a look at this as bigger than Trump. And it is, it is. Systemic racism is just that, it's systemic, it's built in. There's a lot of inequality that's in our system and in our country that happened way before Trump and and will probably keep trying to occur if we don't put it into it, put a stop to it. Okay. So, uh, Angela, I understand that you have a treat for us here tonight. Um, are you going to be introducing Annie Chambers? I am. I right. am. I have the auspicious honor of introducing one of our first speakers, um, Reverend Annie Chambers. Reverend Annie Chambers is a lifelong grassroots community activists um, against poverty, 
for healthcare rights. She's a founding member and past president of, <coughs> excuse me, the Baltimore Welfare Rights Union and co-chair of the National Welfare Rights Union. She's a mother, a grandmother, a great grandmother, if I remember, Reverend Annie. And she's also from the inner city of Baltimore. She is the director of Big Mama's House, which provides daytime shelter for children, feeds homeless people, works with drug addictive parents, helps families and children. Reverend Annie is amazing. And before she comes, I'm, I'm just gonna ask her quickly if she could just open us up with a, a prayer, and then we'll ask her and to share our, her reflections. Reverend, Reverend Annie. Yes, thank you so much for having me. And let me just open up with thanking our Savior, our Master. Thank you, Father, for all that you have given and done for us. Thank you for your many blessings, even at this time when we think the days are dark. We know that the light shines because you love us, because you sent your only son to die for us. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for the sick and the shed in. We thank you for the men and women that's homeless. We thank you, Jesus that you have allowed us to go into the prisons and speak to the prisoners. We thank you. We ask you for your grace and mercy. Just give us the courage, the knowledge, and the strength to continue to fight on. In your name, we ask these and all blessings in your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Reverend Annie. Thank you so much. You know, Reverend Annie, I was thinking about what I wanted to ask you first and foremost. And the one thing that just burned brightly on my brain in terms of what I really want you to be able to share this evening is your wealth of experience and your wealth of wisdom, having participated in the original Poor People's Campaign back in 1968. Mm -hmm. How has this pandemic, given that this pandemic is going on, is this time better or worse than what you experienced in 1968? 1968 was a hard time for poor people and Blacks, um, Jews, and Hispanic people in this country. We had racism, we had poverty, and we could see it. It mm -hmm. was open right there. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at 2020, right now, there's so much that we are happening to us that we don't see. Mm -hmm. It reminds me, uh, Minister Mackams used to say, you gotta watch, you gotta look, you be always mindful because they're cutting your throat and smiling in your face. Mm, mm. See, you can fight when you know you got your enemy right there. But we got some legislators, and not only Donald Trump, we got mm. some politicians all over, and especially here in Maryland, that we we are seeing such a blatant of cutting our throats and we don't know it. We keep smiling. You know, they smiling at us and we say, well, this one is okay, that one, you know. No, this whole scenario between 1968 and now is altogether different. Yes, mm. it is. Mm. When, Dr. King and them decided, first of all, to do the Pope People's Campaign. Dr. King was, had never been truly Pope. He'd never been Pope. Dr. King was a middle-income preacher's child. Now, they was in the South and all that other stuff, but they know poverty like we know poverty. They didn't know it. But the women in welfare rights 
all of us come out of that earl that was at that time. We were struggling with our children, trying to raise our families, and in poverty. So the main thing we were thinking about for our children at that time was food, clothing, shelter, health care, and education. But if you, I put it in the order it was. These days it's altogether different. Because your child could walk out the door and not come back in. You know, I, I also lost a son, a stepson, a young man coming home from work, just got two years of college. He was trying to go to school, be an engineer, and fought for a scholarship and got it. But he didn't come back home last week because he got shot down in a crossfire. My brother worked all his life and they say work hard, work, you know, if you're a hard worker, you're gonna say. But my brother couldn't get decent health care. In 1968, see, we were more aware. People was more aware and, and ready to fight. Then I see people now that this society has put a, a shame, a stigmatism on being poor being poverty. When the last time you hear a politician talk about poor, use that word. See, I make them use it all the time. They be low income. I said, no, I ain't low, I'm poor. <laughs> I'm poor. I'm not low income, I'm poor. <laughs> use the word. See, those are the things that we gotta get people to be able to say. Now, if you wanna say, do I wear a badge of poverty? A, a banner. No, I'm not saying, oh, I'm so happy. I'm, no, I'm not. Because I feel like I should have the basic things in life. See, I, I, I don't need all the luxuries, but I do need food. I need shelter. I need clothing. You know, I would like to see my great great grandchildren, which I am a great great grandmother there, have education. You see, um, I would, you know, these are things I fight for. So when we talk about, then I was fighting for many of my children, my children, which I got, God bless me with 25 of them. And now people say, well, have, are you ready to retire? No, I won't retire till they lay me down. Mm. I will fight until they lay me down. And that's gonna be at least another 25 years. Cause me and God got a deal. You see, I'm, I'm gonna be a hundred years old. But um, if he give me some more, I'll still be fighting. Because we gotta fight to make change. And change will happen. It's gonna come. Maybe not in my lifetime, but I, you know, I tell people, we got to come, you, you don't give up hope. I look back when we fought for food stamps and I tell people how we got food stamps. I tell people how we got even surplus food. I, mm -hmm. I, I want them to know these things so they must understand. They are taking this away from you. They're taking these things away from you. And you, you, you are not fighting welfare rights, we got out there and we changed social workers. Some of us even became social workers. You know, I finally went back, God bless me, so I could go back to school. I had a wonderful priest who helped me, Father Wishland, who go, helped me go back to school and get a master's in social work. But I always knew I had to use that to help others. I had to use that because I remember when I used to be the little lady sitting across from that social worker with tears in my eyes and somebody saying they couldn't do nothing. So we gotta always be able to fight. We gotta teach people to fight. So with the Poe People's Campaign is more of awareness. This campaign, 
I see us having a harder job this time around mm -hmm. than you had from the very first. Because, see, everybody then knew they were poor. Now people don't want you to know they're poor. They're living in the projects and don't get it. Don't want to say, I said, honey, why you live here then? If you, if you ain't poor, why would you want to live in public housing? Mm. You know, you poor, baby. You know, I tell them that all the time. They say, no, I'm low income. I said, no, no, baby. You ain't low. You just poor. You know, those are the things that I see the difference in there is that people want to make a shame of, you know, be shame of poverty. I'm not shame of poverty. I'm not proud of poverty. I want to fight poverty. That's right. That's what we have to do. That's right, Reverend Annie. That is absolutely right. And you know what? When you were mentioning about having persons that are joining this fight and working towards fighting alongside of us, that we need as many people to embrace the reality of our lives, to embrace the reality of our situation so that we can accept that we have a fight on our hands and begin to fight with us. And, and in that vein, we have some more persons who want to share and speak on their perspective in our fight. Hey, David, do you want to bring some persons, some more persons in on this conversation with Reverend Annie? So somebody, yes, I really do. I think this, uh, this is the time to do it. And it just is interesting to listen to uh, Reverend Annie, Reverend, um, <clears throat> this idea, I think, uh, you know, I, I don't, I certainly wouldn't blame somebody who says, well, I'm not poor or someone who said, I'm in the middle class. Um, the truth is that the people in power pulled the wool over our eyes. And I agree with you, Reverend Annie. If I hear one more time, some politician talking about the middle class, and that's like everybody, I'm going to get upset. Uh, it isn't everybody. There are poor people here. There are poor people who are all, almost, there are people who are almost all, almost ready to be poor. Mm -hmm. There are people who are struggling. So we have people who, in that category here who have been impacted by the uh, coronavirus, but also have been first and foremost impacted by our, you know, the injustices in our society. And I would like to introduce this young man first. Uh, and this is, his name is David Stanton. He's a 22 year old native of Maryland. Uh, he graduated from the University of Maryland Eastern Shore with a bachelor in science and rehabilitation psychology. Off pride. Catch yeah. it. Yeah. I mean, this is a smart guy, right? Uh, I don't want to get on a couch under, I, I'm not giving up any of my secrets to him as a psychologist, but he is a very smart person, but he is struggling. And he is struggling because he is bearing the debt of education in our society. So David, if you're there, and hopefully you are, since I've introduced you, um, could you please tell us your story? My name is David Stanton. I hope everybody's doing well. So COVID-19 has impacted my life more than I would have imagined. First and foremost, I lost my grandmother. This loss was a substantial one and it hurt deeply. On top of that, she had many requests for her funeral that could not be met due, due to the circumstances of COVID-19. Mm. I also can no longer work, so my income has been seized completely. Being as though I was a student at the time and not a documented worker, I was not eligible for the first wave of stimulus checks. As of today, they say I am eligible for the second round and I have applied for a stimulus check, but I have yet to actually receive it. This pandemic has also stripped me of my college graduation. Mm -hmm. I've never been a fan of school. <laughs> I spent many years struggling to make it through. After all of those long nights and early mornings working and stressing, I always told myself that the feeling I was going to experience when I walked across the stage was going to fulfill all of the hard work I had put in and make it all worth it. But I never got that feeling. I graduated sitting in my living room with a do-rag on my head <laughs> instead of a cap. The feeling was bittersweet, but I had mixed emotions for sure. I was also left with mixed emotions about the, the amount of money schools, what school was going to cost me. Mm. They say get your education and you'll fulfill the American dream. My bachelor's degree has left me with over $80,000 in student loan debt, mm -hmm. which increases day by day with interest. As a rehab psychology graduate, I should be focused on finding a career in my field 
Instead, I'm focused on creating three streams of income because that's the only thing that will allow me to live comfortably and have a place of my own. The crazy thing is we've come to thinking multiple jobs to survive is normal when it's not. My generation, I'm sorry, our capitalist, our capitalist economy has made it, made it seem like it's necessary to work multiple jobs just to stay above water to keep, mm. to keep living how you want to live, well, how you need to live, I'm sorry, with necessities. My generation is now on track to do worse economically than our parents. We can't keep going backwards. And that's why I'm a part of the Poor People's Campaign. That's, um, I have to say, that's really an amazing, a, a really an amazing and, and uh, troublesome story. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, my daughter is going through the same thing. She graduated. Mm -hmm. She got a job on April 1st as, as a uh, rehabilitation for, for uh, um, children with special needs. And, of course, the COVID virus stopped that. Um, if you were to ask, and, and because cause you talked about you missed the first wave. I mean, why that bill was designed that way so that people like you weren't included is a crime. So if you had to say, what would you say to our congressional delegation mm. about you and other people, because it's just not you, and other people in your situation? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I would say that's inconsiderate. Because mm -hmm. people like me, I was in school, I was working, but I was not a documented worker. So I just feel like they're not thinking about all types of people. And for for those, the people in, in power, they have the ability to make sure we're all fed, to make sure everybody is is taken care of. And they just don't do that. And then they did not do that. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely what I would say. I definitely would say it's inconsiderate. I think you're being too kind, but... <laughs> <laughs> but I think what you have said is just uh, very important for people to hear. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. And Angela, you're going to introduce the next speaker? You know, indeed. And, and one of the ways that I think a lot of students have been done a disservice by um, the legislators that are in session or have been in power for the last couple of years is to allow banks to charge enormous astronomical amounts for uh, of interest for student loans. That's just crazy. It used to be that you could get a student loan around, you know, a 2% student loan or what have you, which gave you some hope of being able to pay it off. But right now, the way they're just hiking up student loans to 12%, 14%. I saw one student that had a 17% interest student loan debt. There's no way. It's, it's, it's crazy. Our next um, participant I'm going to welcome this evening is Claudine Castano. Claudine is an oncology and safety officer, um, a, a nurse, at Johns Hopkins Hospital. She's involved in the effort for nurses there to unionize with the National Nurses United at Hopkins. So Claudine, if you could come on and, and share with us. Go ahead, Claudine. Uh oh, she's muted. She's muted, guys. There, is it working? There we go, okay. there we go. Okay. Um, so hi, I'm Claudine. I'm a nurse at Hopkins, and I know that Hopkins is a pretty household name right now. For It's doing a lot of research and giving a lot of public health recommendations about COVID-19, but on the inside, when you're on the front lines, it's a really different experience from the shiny image they're presenting to the public. Um, one of the really big things that we're facing is not having enough personal protective equipment, or PPE. Uh, one example is N95 masks are the respirators that we use to protect ourselves. We're only supposed to use them for about four to six hours. I personally have had my N95 mask for over a month now. Um, oh, wow. We're just having to use them forever until they literally fall apart. Um, it's not just that supply, we're even trying to use the cleaning solutions to try to make these things last as long as possible. And we're running out of those. We're like cutting wipes in half. We're just running out of cleaning solutions. Um, and on top, so it's not only that we don't have enough supplies, it's also that when, we're, when you go to coronavirus units, you're floated there without any warning. Um, it doesn't, 
they're, you're basically voluntold, um, and we're not given any training on how to care for this unique patient population. Coronavirus patients are really sick and uniquely sick in a way that we've never seen before. Um, and they demand a lot of attention and focus, but every single unit has come up with its own practices, its own standards and ways of doing things because we have no information. Um, there's also no widespread testing of its workers for COVID-19. And even after nurses have had exposure to it, you have to add, like fight for permission to be tested. Wow. Um, and so there have been cases where like um, nurses have been, uh, have, have, been positive and were working on the unit and didn't know it, and yet they won't give testing to any other nurse on the unit because they're like, oh no, it's fine, we promise. Um, and on a wider hospital level, that's how it is on each individual unit. You get to the unit, they don't even tell you where the bathrooms are, you have to find it yourself. You don't even know where the beds are kept. You're trying to like work with PPE that you don't know if it's really clean or not, and you've been using it forever. And mm -hmm. then on top of it, you're like taking care of these sick patients, and they're just people. They're just like you. They want ginger ale, or they want to go home to their families. They're just regular folks who you're trying to help with all these roadblocks in place. Um, and then on the wider, higher hospital level, Hopkins has also implemented a hiring freeze and has furloughed a huge chunk of their workforce. Um, and we really need staff right now. And they're just saying we're not allowed to use them. Uh, I've been explicitly told at times where, that we're not allowed to use uh, nurses because they're too expensive. Um, and to uh, the final like insult to injury is far from giving us hazard pay or even talking about that, they've actually taken away our raises for the next two years. And they've also decreased our retirement contributions for the next two years. Wow. Um, and so it's great that they took away my raise, but my rent is still going to go up and I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, so all of this, all of these things that I've just talked about are being done to save money. And you know, as well as I do that Hopkins pretty much always chooses to put profits over people and our working conditions in this pandemic are just a continuation of that trend. Um, it is pretty hard to work in these conditions, but that's not what's actually important to us. What's important is that it endangers our patients. In Maryland, 30% of COVID cases, cases and 42% of the deaths are African Americans. And both nurses and our patients are sacrificed when the hospital puts patient profits first. Um, this kind of behavior and the things that we're working with also have long lasting repercussions throughout the community. Many nurses are first time graduates in their families and nursing as a career is a pathway for women across the world to gain independence and financial security. Uh, many immigrants come to this country as nurses and new nurse graduates especially are the cheapest and most vulnerable of us. And yeah. they're being, their orientations are being cut short. New graduates are being forced into non-nursing positions to like during their internship periods where they were supposed to be gaining experience and instead they're just using them as fodder. Um, and and it's, so it's robbing these future uh, group of nurses from really getting the experience and start to their careers that they need. Mm -hmm. um, in general, it just feels like overall, in every way they can, Hopkins is throwing hardworking people from poor backgrounds into the fire to make more profit. Um, and a healthcare system that falls apart under a pandemic like it's doing now is a system that is fundamentally broken and an institution that uses a global pandemic as an opportunity for name recognition, but then also uses it to undercut their workers' sense of worth and their ability to care for their patients. That's a prime example of that broken system. So we have to undo that system that created this crisis that exacerbates every health disparity to new extremes. And I know that everyone talks about how these are unprecedented times, but that also means that this is a new time that we can use to do new things. Nurses want to try and use this crisis as a catalyst to change the way that things are being done and work towards a new system because we think that all people should be treated with inherent value. It just can't continue like this. It's just wrong. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. My goodness. It, you know what? I One of the things that I wanted to... Um, that I personally am concerned and worried about, especially that this is Memorial Day weekend and we're expecting the beaches and that's Memorial Day weekend is that weekend that kind of kicks off the summer. But in the state of Maryland, we're starting to, we were starting to see our numbers leveled off. I'm worried about the exposure that persons who are going to be opening themselves up to, um, with us starting to open up. What do you think about uh, us being able to be open for business and, and open for recreation and things like that? Speaking from a nurse's perspective. 
She's muted. Oh. <laughs> I mute her. Thank you. Oh, there you Thank go. you. Sorry, I was like, oh no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I definitely think it's way too early to open the state. I think it's way early to open most states. Um, I. I am not, I don't know like the validity of this, but I saw a news article that said that this past Monday was the highest bump in cases that Maryland has reported since the beginning of the pandemic entirely. Mm. That was right after the first weekend um, where they reopened. We have reopened way too early. I am very, very worried. Um, other problems is that like even if we are going to reopen okay let's say that we do reopen but we're not taking any of the precautions that we should be taking people aren't wearing masks people aren't observing distance and like things like that people you know, and it's partially because as a society we haven't given them ways to do that or as a society we're not encouraging it because it's not as important as putting poor people back to work to make money for large corporations and that mm -hmm. is intolerable it's the like, it is sometimes easy when you're sitting at home to forget about the, all the how intense this is and how serious a disease it is. But when you work in the hospital, like I do, and you see it every day, you can't forget. You see these patients and you look in their eyes and you see how scared they are. Um, I saw a study that said that um, getting coronavirus is this, the impact it has on your lungs is the same as smoking five packs a day every day for two years. Wow. Um, it is a very serious illness and it is easy to forget that, but the people who will be, who will work themselves into the ground trying to save you is us. And if you overload us, we won't be able to protect you. And it just worries me um, because it could be avoided. We don't have to open this early, um, but it is larger profit people who are making that happen. That's very true. Steve, um, in one of the chat comments, said that if top-rated Johns Hopkins Hospital is treating its professionals like this, imagine what it's like across the country. I know in another Baltimore um, hospital, they were actually, they ran out of all protective equipment entirely, and they were telling nurses to go into these patient rooms without any protection of any kind, and a lot of nurses quit because they couldn't do it. Like you have, they had to, they had to choose between protecting their, their patients or their families and they chose like. So I, I, your, your, your story is, is truly uh, both inspiring and, and shocking. Um, I've been a union organizer and um, we don't have time to go into all of it, but I understand that you, uh, you referenced this, you're building a union there. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Oh. And uh, for all the money and all the PR that Hopkins puts out, not money, but hot PR, I'm sure they're not acting like a good citizen when it comes to your rights to build a union. No, they're not. Um, they actually hired, okay, I'm not muted. <laughs> they're not, they actually hired a huge, um, the same uh, anti-union busting company that was used by Trump um, and they are using it against us. Um, they have poured millions of dollars into busting our union, but taking away our raises, especially at a time like this, has helped the union, I guess. I mean, yeah. it shouldn't have come to this, but it's become so urgent for so many of us that there is momentum now, like, that we have never seen before. Um, nurses are angry. They're tired and they're angry, and I am also tired and angry. <laughs> but, well, listen, thank you very much. Um, you know, it, it, we talked to David first. David graduated, is trying to get into the working world, can't get in. And then the system, you know, and politicians here in Maryland are making it more difficult for him to survive until he can. You come in with aspirations, you know, ready to go and you hit a wall, right? So I wanna to talk to somebody else tonight as well, Claudine Castano, and um, Cla Claudine. No, Nicole. Uh, Nicole, <laughs> I am so sorry about that. Um, uh, yes, Nicole Hansen Mundell is the executive director of Out of Justice, an organization comprised of individuals directly impacted by the criminal justice system. And uh, it is no secret about the absolute panic going on within prisons and jails in this country in the era of. of uh, the coronavirus and COVID-19. So Nicole, if you'd like to tell us about the work and what you're seeing on the ground.
Nicole. Is she there? Is she there? I think we'll probably have to go back to her. I'm not seeing oh, her. Okay. Well, if Nicole is not ready, um, I, I definitely have someone that I wouldn't hear from. Um, Tisha Guthrie. Tisha Guthrie is on the line. She is the president of the Bolton House Tennis Association, which is in Baltimore City. And in this time, I often am concerned about persons being able to find adequate housing and, and things of that nature, being able to, to just survive. Tisha, if, are you there? Can you share with us what you've experienced on the ground? Yes, thank you so much for um for this initiative, first of all, and for giving me a voice. Bolton House Residents Association was established uh, about a year and a half ago. And that was really after we, as a few residents, were encountering horrible conditions. Conditions like black mold, rodent and pest infestation, um, deteriorating infrastructure, constant leaks whenever it rains, things like that. And we did our due diligence to approach and have these issues addressed by the management. And we were basically retaliated against and had no other choice but to seek out and to find some help with organizing. Um, I reached out to an organization that, well, whom I had been following their campaign in DC called PSL, and that's the Party for Socialism and Liberation. And, you know, I've just been receiving their emails, and thank goodness I held on to one and reached out to one of their organizers, and she contacted me immediately. So we got, we got running with um, just trying to figure out what it was that we really wanted to see, what kind of changes we wanted to see in our building, and, um, just knowing that a lot of people in Baltimore are in circumstances where the constant rat race of trying to meet your basic needs, trying to just put food on the table and a roof over your head, puts them in, the, in a position of really not having the time, literally the time, nor the energy to organize. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we got some help. We started petitioning in the in the building and actually taking pictures of people's living conditions and it, you wouldn't believe it i mean for people to be living in apartments where there's visible black mold wow. um where the walls are are speckled red because of bed bugs um just and again this is this is due to negligence. This is due to not an in incapacity, inability to address the issues, but um, just deeming, ho however you want to put it, however, uh, deeming people not, not worthy of mm. a livable standard. And once we started putting our concerns and our issues um, and using social media, putting it out there and uh, allowing people to see how their neighbors, your very neighbors are living. Um, that's when we actually started seeing management address some of our issues. And it's really a shame that you have to shame people into doing what is right. And that's all we, we were asking, for them to do what is right. And um, this COVID-19 has kind of exacerbated some of our issues because now um, you know, I'm a transplant patient. I, and I, I'm, I'm going to reach out to Claudette because, uh, or Claudia, because she's at one of my, at my hospital. I had a trans, two transplants at, Hops, at Hopkins mm -hmm. and I'm immunocompromised. And so living in a building with mold is a huge hazard, is a huge hazard. And, um, I, as a result of this pandemic, I've lost both of my part-time jobs. Mm. Um, I'm, and you know, just like the initial speaker, um, I'm sorry, I cannot recall his name. That's another uh, side effect of mold, mold exposure. Yeah, David. Yeah, your, your memory starts to be affected. 
<laughs> but, um, you know, I have a master's degree. I'm a licensed social worker. And, you know, because I have impaired vision, I've had some setbacks in my career. Mm. Um, so, you know, there are multiple factors that place people like me in situations where, you know, I have no problem with admitting I'm poor. Right. You know, um, and just like you mentioned earlier, the, the semantics that we use now to try and put a facade on circumstances. George Carlin used to, he used to have a, a stand up where he would talk about how politicians now are trying to make everything sound so rosy. You know, now people have income disparity. No, they're poor. Right. You know, um, and, but now we're seeing that a lot of people are just a month or two away from being financially desperate. And this is a constant lesson that our country is having to learn, that situations and circumstances do not have moral implications. Mm. You know, it took for a country to be exposed to an opioid epidemic, for now it to be deemed a mental health disparity, for now it to be a medical condition. But when I was in high school um, and the crack epidemic was far wide and spreading in the urban community, you know, it was those people. And when the face of, an, of a problem, problem uh, changes, when it's now, when it now looks like you, it now looks like your sisters and your cousins and the people that you associate with, now it's a public health issue and it's not a moral failing. Mm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's brought a this, this epidemic has brought a lot to the forefront that's always been in the background. Right. And right now, as was said earlier, we have the chance to look at this American experiment and deem it unsuccessful. It's unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. The majority of people in this country are suffering. And this circumstance has brought to light that we need, this is a coming to Jesus time, right. you know, and we have the opportunity now to really question where we're going to go from this point and what it's going to look like. That's absolutely right. You are absolutely right, Tisha. Mark, Mark Council, I want to bring you in on this conversation too. Mark is a leader with Housing Our Neighbors a Community Co-op led by the homeless and formerly homeless in Baltimore City. Mark, if you can be online, I wanna bring you in right now to speak on what you're noticing from the ground because what Tisha is just sharing about the conditions at Bolton House, I'm sure you have some more um, insight with regard to how our homeless persons are being treated and affected. Uh oh, you're still on mute. There we go. There you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, yes, um, I'm going to talk to you about far as how the coronavirus has impacted the homeless in Baltimore. I lived in a shelter for, um, 20, for 2012 to 2016, and I'm still homeless. I didn't feel that I didn't feel that my life meant anything in the shelter. I saw firsthand and I saw firsthand and dignity of the living in the shelter. That's why I got involved with HUN, Housing Our Neighbors. There, there is a lot of things that I saw that I could say about living in the shelter. The one thing that hits me the hardest is the death that I have saw and witnessed. It was, it was like that these people didn't matter to the staff, to the city. Also, the coronavirus, um, the coronavirus has got to a point where people are living in the shelter are most vulnerable. There are 375 people that live in this shelter using the same bathroom, sleeping quarters, and kitchen. 
it's no way possible that you can stay six feet away from one another and we all piled up in the same area. Basic face masks, hand soap, and hand sanitizer are scarce there. Mm. It's like the city have not taken care of any of us. Wow. Just left us alone. So when Hun Housing Our Neighbors started the Empty the Camp Empty the Shelters campaign, we demand the we demand the mayor to act fast and act immediately to to place all all people, all homeless people into hotels and permanent housing. That the long that delay that delay that the mayor has put in that has put more people into danger, more death, we will see. We have, we have interrupted the mayor's press conference and had a vigil at his house. The vigil paid respect, remembrance and respect to the homeless people who had died from the coronavirus in Washington and New York. That's why it's important that we connect across the state and the country to fight together. We can't do this alone. And I am willing to join the Poor People's Campaign. Our solution to this coronavirus, to save lives and to stop the spread, quarter, permanent portable, affordable houses for us all. Indeed, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Mark. You know, one of my concerns right now in terms of the coronavirus and, and our homeless community, not only is, uh, am I really afraid that they're not receiving any kind of protection or any kind of, of, of access to, um, information to keep themselves safe, but I'm also concerned that they're just being discarded in a, in a, in a really insidious way at this point. I mean, it was bad enough that they're homeless, but now it's almost, I'm worried that they're going to be treated like, uh, like pariahs in our society, even worse than what they already are. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Yeah. Um, we had a uh, one other speaker. Hey, yeah. David, do you want to yeah. tell us about what's going on? And, 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 and this is, life is real, you know. Uh, uh, we had Ronaldo Jingjong, Dingjong, who is, uh, as, as well as uh, Claudine, is, is building a union. He is an airport worker at BWI, and unfortunately he had to take his mom to the hospital. Uh, so he is not with us, but his organizer is, and that is Allison Yuda. And uh, I, I think it's important to hear his story, even if it's told through her, and she certainly knows him well. Uh, so I'd like to call on Allison to talk about this. Uh, airport workers, you, you know, you wouldn't think it, but it's very real. He's unemployed, etc. And Allison, would you like to come on and please tell his story? Sure. Um, yeah, my name is Allison, and um, I'm an organizer. I'm, I know Ronaldo from the airport. Um, he's a sky cap, so he helps folks check in their bags. He, they're, they're, the sky caps are like the face of the um, airport. They're the, fir the first face that passengers see when, um, when they're going in to the airport. Unfortunately, these sky caps before they got laid off were making $5 an hour. Um, and it was, they relied mostly on tips. And, um, you know, they were the first people to be, they were some of the first people to be laid off at the airport. Um, and that means that, you know, now they have to apply for unemployment. And um, unfortunately for Ronaldo, right, um, he had to wait, he applied for unemployment, he had to wait about maybe two months or so for him to be able to receive the benefits um and it was a really stressful situation for him because um he's basically the caretaker of his 80 year old mother 
and um you know he he has a part time at Walmart but it's definitely not enough to um you know be able to pay his bills his rent he has kids um he has family back in the Philippines that he helps out and it just was not enough um so he's been organizing with his coworkers for a union to raise wages and to receive you know um benefits in the workplace um but it is a really uncertain time because you know people don't know since there's nobody traveling this has affected airport workers a lot since you know they're not making tips um you know they just they're just there's really no um people at the airport so it doesn't make sense to have all these employees there and um you know ronaldo like i said he takes care of his mother she's 80 years old for the past week or so she's been uh hospitalized because she's been having she had heart bypass surgery and um she was having issues with her breathing um since the weekend um her heart stopped twice and they had to um revive her basically and um she was discharged today and um unfortunately it seems like her breathing issues are back so they might have to take her back to the hospital and so that's why unfortunately ronaldo was in this meeting at first but he had to step out but um but yeah that's pretty much the situation at the airport these guys are making as little as five dollars an hour again relying mostly on tips and now that there's this lack of travel this lack these this lack of passengers at the airport due to the pandemic um it has really affected them a lot so so allison yeah this um mm -hmm. uh it, it is sort of interesting maybe you just want to comment or maybe you just want to go on a rant about it uh but you know these companies southwest in in, in this in this uh conjuncture peanuts is southwest is known for peanuts and that's apparently what they pay workers uh but these companies are asking for billions of dollars in bailouts oh, oh. right you know they, yeah and and here we can't get our congressmen uh our, our leaders to understand like david stanton was saying right to to take care of the workers who make the skies friendly <laughs> okay mm -hmm. when do and and what, what's that mean in terms of your organizing campaign and 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 um and um yeah ronaldo's i mean well workers feel like they you know this has highlighted like uh or emphasized the needs that they already felt before but it just kind of puts an emphasis on things like you know the importance of having like affordable uh or a quality health insurance right and paid sick days mm -hmm. um because these guys literally if you got sick and you had to stay home like i mean that was basically you're basically having to choose between making your wages for that day mm -hmm. or you know staying home and you know recovering um so it really has been it really has motivated um a lot of our workers to push to organize um they were very intimidated by the company that they work for they're subcontracted by southwest by a company called prospect airport services and the company um has fired leaders has um you know they have just had an anti-union campaign there but through all of that workers especially right now during this pandemic have felt even more of an they feel the importance of why, you know, they need to have a union and why they need to have a collective power in the workplace. And they've been finding ways to organize right now through Zoom calls. Um, and so they're just pushing, they're really motivated by this. And, uh, you know, they know that they deserve more and that's what they've been doing. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, there's just, uh, you know, I would just say this, and I want to turn it back to Angela because we do need to wrap up. But um, uh, workers in this country, to have a union, have to be be willing to bleed for it. Uh, the the type of campaigns that unions go through, Claudia and others, uh, um, uh, Allison talked about. People. Nor, us, nor, you know, normal folks who have never gone through one have no idea what it's like. It is, it is a horror show. 
And if, if, if vote, we as voters had to go through the kind of campaigns that workers have to go through to have a union in this country, there would be a revolt. Unfortunately, we have to keep in mind that if it's up to Trump, we very, and Republicans, we very soon might will be doing that. So I want to turn it back over to Angela and to, to, get, to wrap this baby up. Yes, indeed. Thank you, David. And you know what? One of the things that I, I really want to emphasize is that we have got to vote. Vote like your life depends on it because it does. Your life absolutely depends on your vote. And don't let uh, any party try to steal your vote away. That's why they're fighting so hard to take the vote from you, to make ways that it, make it impossible for you to vote, to take away the times and things like that. So there are three things that I want you to take away from this meeting tonight, from this town hall. Three things that I want you to definitely take away. One, like I just mentioned, vote. The primary is coming up in June. We have got to show up and show out. Then the election is coming up in November and we are definitely, definitely needing to be in place. That's the first thing. The second thing, the census. Our communities depend on the numbers for the census. So you have got to register or to fill out your census. If you have not completed the census right now, you need to make sure that is done. So that's your second thing, vote, the census. And then lastly, lastly, to go to June 20th, June2020.org, June2020.org. That's the poor people's campaign. Org. You can get to it there. June2020.org. Sign up, register, and be a part of the very first mass gathering of, of the century, of, the, of this. We've never done anything. It, this has never been done. And so we want to make sure that you are available and that you are a participant in what will be an astronomical gathering of the poor and low wealth from all across this country. We wanna make sure that you are registered to vote and that you vote in the next coming election, register for the census or, and fill out your census and make sure you join the movement. June 20th, 2020 is going to be a phenomenal date and we need your help. We need your participation. We need you to go to our Facebook page, sign up. We need you to join the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We need all of us in this because someone has, is hurting our brother and it's gone on far too long. I wanna thank Reverend Annie Chambers. I wanna thank um, Allison for sharing Ronaldo's testimony. I wanna thank Claudine Castano and David Stanton, Tisha Guthrie, Mark Council. And I wanna even thank Nicole Hansen Mundell who showed up that we didn't have enough time to just fit that in. But also want to, before we close out, I wanna invite Reverend Abi of Cedar Lane Ut Unitarian Universalist Church to come and share some closing remarks to close us out in, in a meditation or prayer or, and just kind of wrap us all up. Reverend Abi, are you there? Is Reverend Abi still there? Yes, I'm here. Hey, there we go. Greetings, Reverend Abi. Greetings, Reverend Angela, good to see you. Good to see you too. If you can close us out. Yes. Would you all join me in the spirit of prayer, reflection, or meditation? Nameless one of many names, whose living form is a radical and courageous love that will not let us go, let us down, or let us off the hook. We are connected across time and space, connected by invisible droplets that have come to instruct us, connected across all the reasons that separate and divide, connected by our humanness and our fragility. 
May we remember through our journeys that our one body is made for love. Our one body is love. Our one body is our being. Our one body is our ability to understand, to experience the passage of time and to create action. Our one body is held by one precious earth. Our one body must cure the human virus, the sickness of hatred, the cancers of racism, poverty, and militarism, the gangrenes of political and financial greed, the inflammations of religious nationalism and bigotry, and the fatalities of violence. Spirit of love and justice, liberate our selfish understandings of freedom in order that we may truly live into the call to freedom to love one another and serve each other in love. Teach us how to step out on faith and look for ways to love each other boldly. Let us not be people who are complacent and satisfied by the way things have always been, but give us a mind to challenge the tradition and habits that perpetuate injustice and inequality. Help us to peel back the layers in our own understanding and uncover the truths of the systems of injustice. May we consider carefully what we heard and learned tonight and listen to the testimonies of those most affected by injustice and oppression. Be with us, O Spirit, as we stay in place, stay alive, organize, mobilize, resist, and build power to demand that everyone has the right to live during this pandemic and beyond. Lead us to be a part of the change, to bring forth the beloved community of justice and equity and peace into ever fuller expression in our world. These and the prayers of our hearts, our hands, and our feet, we pray now in the name of all that is holy, life-affirming, life-sustaining, we say peace, salam, shalom, om shanti, amen. Amen. And may we also keep in our hearts and minds those of those uh, warriors for, for the justice that we seek who have lost their lives and that we've lost but have never lost our memory of them. Our beloved team members like Alonzo Smith of Montgomery County, his memory will be a benediction to all of us and we will continue to fight in their memory. Thank you all. Thank you all for joining us. Don't forget June 20th, 2020. We want to see you there. We encourage you to join us and participate in this movement forward together and not one step back. That's right. Night off. Good night. Oh, somebody's hurting my brother and it's gone on far too long.
a powerful new movement is rising across America. From the Mississippi Delta to the Apache Stronghold, from the homeless encampments of Washington to the coal fields of West Virginia, we are the 140 million poor and low wealth people in this country, and we are building the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. On June 20th, between the primaries and the general election, we will rise together for the Mass Poor People's Assembly and Moral March on Washington, a digital justice gathering. Our nation is at a historic crossroads. There are those who say big change isn't necessary or possible, that we are powerless to make our lives better. But history teaches us that it is exactly in times like these that people from all walks of life must build a broad and deep movement from the bottom up. On June 20th, we will come together to lift the voices and faces of poverty in the midst of pandemic for a massive historic online gathering that will embolden us, strengthen us, and prepare us to fight for the kind of society we know we so badly need and deserve. Rise with us. Visit June2020.org.